Go. Happy Friday, YouTube, and welcome back for another episode of AI News, Drama, and Updates. On your screen right now, we're taking a look at AI Riz, which is just a fun little thing I came across on Reddit. Subtitles for the real world. We looked at something a little bit similar not too long ago, and as you can see, the technology is still something people are working on, the ability to read lips, to use large language models, and turn it into real-time closed captioning. And as you're seeing on your screen right now, Meta has open source MusicGen, which is a framework for generating sounds and music, but this isn't a new thing that they just developed, they just suddenly decided to open source it. The thing that was new here is something they refer to as AudioCraft. It's a framework to generate high quality, realistic audio and music from short text descriptions or prompts. And it looks like AudioCraft is the name of everything kind of being wrapped up. MusicGen appears to be one of the options that are here. So AudioCraft, according to this article, contains three generative AI models, MusicGen, AudioGen, and Encodec. And while this article does, in fact, go on to point out that there are legal and ethical concerns, of course, with generating music, and really just setting foot into AI music in general is probably going to draw the ire of the RIAA and, and really any of the associations that are meant to capitalize off of recording artists. So give it a couple of weeks and we're bound to hear about a lawsuit or something like that, I would imagine. But in the meantime, this does seem to be a lot less dangerous than something like Eleven Labs has the capability of being. Which, just as a reminder, is more of the deepfake type of thing, where it can kind of recreate your voice in just a few seconds. And when we first took a look at AI-generated music in general, of course it was novel and kind of janky, and that was the reason that it was interesting. But as time marches on, we've reached a point where it's becoming less and less obvious that it is AI-generated. And so we're kind of in an uncanny valley area of music, so to speak. And I think just like we saw with AI art, that's going to create a lot of worry. I'm sure there's a lot of people who've dedicated their lives to music who are now a little bit more worried that they can be potentially replaced. But if you come to my channel for more fear-mongering, really this isn't the place for that. I don't think video killed the radio star, and, and I don't think AI is going to be the end of art or music or self-expression in general. Now, of course, when it comes to the capitalism side of things, I have no idea what's going to happen. We do know that capitalism and the free market will adapt and change. It always has and it always will. But we don't know what that future is going to look like yet. It's very uncertain, and that scares a lot of people, especially people who have money, who have power, and depend on maintaining that. And so that's where a lot of the fears are coming from, and a lot of the lobbying and resistance to change in general. Yet no surprise there, it's coming from the people who potentially stand to lose the most. But while a lot of mainstream media websites, articles, news broadcasts, what have you, are all trying to get you to be afraid of AI and the future that may or may not happen as a result of AI, I do also want to show the other side of the coin. You know, here's an example of AI being used to give someone the power to walk again. For a moment, try to put yourself in Keith's shoes here. In New York in 2020, he was paralyzed from his chest down. He hasn't been able to walk ever since. And now, with the power of AI and something called a neural bypass, they're using AI to interpret brain signals and to fill in the gaps, essentially allowing his brain to get the signals that it had lost. In what I imagine was a very experimental and potentially very desperate feeling procedure, they were able to restore feeling for this guy. And no, he's not 100%, not yet, but the brain is neuroplastic, and it can potentially interpret these new signals and eventually learn to adapt. And as a result of this machine learning AI-based technology, this guy may be better able to live a more full life now. And for the past couple of weeks here and there, there have been medical advances or medical announcements where AI or machine learning-based AI is being used more and more often in the medical world. We talked here about Palm Med 2, which was the language behind Google Bard, and now it's already being used in like the Mayo Clinic and places like that. So this week I wanted to include this link from the Google blog if you had any interest in wanting to dive a little bit deeper into the multimodal medical AI, and that's the ability to use like video and sound and pictures and text all together at once. I think it's important to remind ourselves that even right now, we're still at the very frontier of this technology, and it really is the worst it's going to be. It's going to be a better and better doctor every month that goes by, every year that goes by. You know, these systems, whether it's ChatGPT or MedPalm, they're designed to basically be trained from interaction. You know, just like we are, we get better with our successes and our failures and our experiences. So do these systems. You know, and of course, there's going to be concerns when we do start eventually putting more and more power into the hands of a cold, distant, and uncaring machine, right? But at the same time, 
It's not like we don't have problems right now with those types of issues and real human doctors. I think ultimately, just like anything, we have to weigh our pros and our cons and see which is better for us, for society, and as individuals. So I'll leave you with that on this one, but definitely check out the link in the description if you want to read up a little bit more on Med Palm. Okay, so there was something a little bit weird that took place last week, and I wasn't really aware of this, but apparently if you went to AI.com, it was for a long while going to ChatGBT. Apparently people had written articles about it and all kinds of stuff. But I don't have the impression that OpenAI actually owns that domain because now it's starting to redirect to X.AI or Twitter or whatever you want to call it nowadays. Based on how everything took place and how everything rolled out, I think the only assumption that we can make is Elon, who is apparently the biggest fan in the world of the letter X, has gone to somebody to have them either redirect this domain or maybe has purchased it for himself. But again, the long and short of it is AI.com doesn't go to ChatGPT anymore. It goes to Twitter for whatever reason. If you're like me and you never thought Cortana was a good idea in the first place, this is probably going to be an exciting headline for you. I think in the battle between the Google Assistant and Siri and Cortana, people don't really even think about Cortana. So it's good to know that this is being completely done away with, and it's likely to be replaced with Copilot, which we've been talking about for a few weeks now. People who are running a beta build for Windows in some cases now have a sidebar where they actually have a number of different Copilot-like features. But again, those things are going to be very heavily integrated with Bing, which is one of my least favorite things. So I'm not going to be trying it out myself. I won't be able to show you much here, but I will be covering the news and articles that come out as a result. So while it's not the most directly AI related thing that I could cover, I just wanted to let people know that if you are using Windows, if this is at all part of your workflow and it suddenly disappears on you, you might be able to look forward to what's coming next because it's likely to be a lot more valuable to you than Cortana ever was. And in terms of other somewhat related updates, I just wanted to keep everyone apprised that the writer strike is still ongoing. Given that it is partly AI in nature that they're striking about, I continue to cover it here. But the interesting thing here is that the Grammys, which aren't going to be out for a while, have been actually postponed. I wanted to point to this headline so that people can see that they're not anticipating coming to terms with the writers or the actors here if they've already anticipated that the Emmys are going to be delayed. Remember, it's just now the beginning of August. This is a decision that was likely made a few weeks ago, and the Emmys aren't until September 18th. So it doesn't appear that they're on the verge of any kind of negotiation fix at this point. But I did want to draw people's attentions back to this for the moment, because we haven't yet seen any of these studios go to an extreme and hire like nothing but scabs or try to make something that's completely AI generated. But I'm curious at this point what the resolution is going to be. If they're going to straight out refuse to work with actors and writers and try to run entire movie studios with just executives, I mean, where is the talent? And like I said last week, if you got into a point where your business is just you and AI, it's not going to be much of a business for long. It's not going to have immense value for other people because it's something that they could just do on their own if they also wielded an AI tool, right? Now, personally, I do believe that the writers and the actors are eventually going to come out on top. It's surprising to see that the people are holding out this long. It's just cruel at this point. They're waiting for people to start running out of money and start losing their homes and things like that. And their hope is that that desperation causes them to undervalue themselves and they'll again return to work for pennies on the dollar. You know, maybe if they're hungry enough, they'll be likely to sign these likeness rights away in perpetuity, right? And that's the line of thinking of these terrible executives. And yeah, I'm even talking about Disney for example. But switching gears a little bit, I did come across a story about Kickstarter. Looks like Kickstarter is going to be starting up a new policy where they're going to be asking you to basically declare what elements of AI are being used and things like that, just for transparency, just for clarity. I think the intentions here are probably fine, but this is a policy that I don't know how it can be enforced, and I don't know that there's much in the way of teeth to it. You know, for example, does Kickstarter take their money back if it turns out you violated the policy? That would be interesting. And how would it get proven? You know, each week that goes by, there seem to be less tools to detect AI, and AI is becoming more and more like anything that you've created yourself. So it's going to only be harder over time to detect what elements AI was used for as it gets more ingrained within our normal processes. But I think it does make sense right now at this point in time, there's a lot of people who are looking at this as humans versus AI. Because until these things become normal and part of our daily culture, they're going to seem foreign and weird and unfair. A great example of that was from an article I saw here about an Arizona law school. Now, they're going a very different route, and they're embracing the usage of ChatGPT in student applications. Now, this is certainly not a universal policy. It looks like the University of Michigan decided to ban AI tools. 
And this article is very brief and there's not a lot of meat to it, but what it looks like it comes down to is how you view AI. If it's a cheat or if it's a tool. If it's something that's doing the job for you, of course that's not right. And if it's something that's helping you to do the job and leveling the playing field so that everyone has access to this tool and everyone can be just as smart as everyone else. Now, whether or not you agree, that's what it looks like Arizona State University is looking at this tool as. It says here, Leeds believes that generative AI widely available to applicants, regardless of their economic situation, can potentially level the playing field for those who might not be able to afford or hire a professional consultant. Now, this was news to me that there are professional consultants that help students with their applications to get into school. And when you think about that, which apparently costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes in fees, which is wild to me. But yeah, when you look at it through that lens, it seems like GPT type services can level the playing field a bit more. I didn't realize it was that uneven. But it feels like, if nothing else, from a fairness perspective, this is an interesting conversation topic and definitely a subject of debate. I'm looking forward to seeing some comments about this one. But in the meantime, let's look toward the future. Now, I was going to make a whole video on my vision of what I thought Google Assistant could be. And then I started all of a sudden seeing headlines about the changes that they're already making to Google Assistant. Because honestly, it's been mind boggling to me that a company that has access to something like Bard didn't immediately integrate that into the Assistant that's being used on my Android and my Google Hub and those types of things. But it looks like based on what I'm seeing that that's a direction that they've been thinking about and working on for months now. And we might start seeing changes sometime soon. I haven't talked about it much here, but I've complained about it a little bit on the Discord. The Google Assistant, the way that it stands right now is abysmal. You know, when I'd originally got the idea to start turning my home and originally just one room into like a smart room, I got an idea of how difficult these things were. You know, it's like they sell the idea as making your life easier, but the reality is it's, it's not much easier. It's actually more complicated and it's really frustrating at times. You know, when everything's working great, these systems can be fine, but when you have a power outage or the internet goes out, they can get really, really inconvenient very quickly. But aside from that, when they do understand you perfectly, they don't really give you relevant results to what you're asking. And that, I think, is the biggest area of opportunity that Google Assistant has always really had. You know, I may still eventually put together a video on where I see this technology eventually going, but I do love the idea of having things becoming more and more integrated. You know, having it all work from a centralized hub and having AI eventually have control over that is going to make things a lot more convenient in the future, hopefully. But yeah, speaking of the future, let's talk about this Wall-E headline because Google's RT2 AI model is apparently bringing us one step closer to that. So what is this? We've got Robotic Transformer 2, first of its kind model, and it's able to use text and vision to essentially solve problems. So you can see here from put the strawberry into the correct bowl to move the apple to the Denver nuggets, this thing can understand physics and the reality of the world around it. It can look at a scene and, and kind of picture what it is. What we're seeing right now with this feels to me like a sandwich of the technologies of some of the things that we've seen, whether it's large language models being able to process language to the visual models that are able to process visual stimuli. But these smaller models and smaller processes are coming together to what to me forms like the beginnings of a positronic brain. This is where we can eventually get to the point of a humanoid robot with a real artificial intelligence, or at least the illusion of AI until AGI comes about. As with everything, the link for this is going to be in the description. It's probably worth checking out, though, if you want to really take a deep dive. It's a little bit of a lengthier article, but there's a lot of visual stuff here and a lot of examples where it's really asking more open ended questions and not necessarily being very direct. You know, this isn't all put the strawberry in the basket. You know, for example, here, this is just a list of objects and it's saying what's the most useful thing to hammer a nail and there's no hammer in the picture. So it's up to the AI models to make a determination on what would be the best thing to actually hammer based on the visual stimuli that's here. It's more complex than we're probably giving it credit for at first glance. Now, Google calls this chain of thought reasoning, and this may have something to do with the inclusion of the technology that was used in AlphaGo. That was a problem solving type of robot. I and mean, that system was designed to solve problems and to outthink humans. But even Google admits that this isn't a perfect thing yet. This is something that's obviously very, very alpha, not even beta yet. And from what it sounds like, they're still working through a lot of limitations. But this is extremely promising. And of course, it's amazing how fast everything is kind of coming together. All right, so I wanted to end today's video talking about something that's not necessarily AI generated. Now, I'm thinking AI probably did come up with this formula, but that's just a theory. But I wanted to basically just have a nutshell version of LK99 here for the people that have had questions about it, for people that are following the story of a potential superconductor. 
So here's the long and short of it. Here's what it is and why it's important. All right, so on a very basic level, LK99 is a potential room temperature superconductor. Now, if you're still unsure what a superconductor itself is, it's just something that can transmit electricity without any kind of resistance, which, while it doesn't sound incredibly amazing, is just something that's not found in nature. It's not something that we can easily access. And if we did have access to something like that, it would actually remove a lot of restrictions that we have on modern technology. You know, for example, a lot of the heat generation that comes from computers comes from electrical resistance. So if we were to create a system that didn't have any electrical resistance, we would essentially take the speed limit away. You know, as we know with computers, especially like gaming computers or these machines with graphic processing units in, they kick out a lot of heat when we're doing intense processing. And that premise across the board is what makes superconductors very valuable to us, whether you're using them inside of generators or things like computers. So if you were unsure of why a superconductor would be this amazing holy grail that people have been searching for for years, that's what it is. And so that aside, let's talk about LK99. So LK99 is a proposed room temperature superconductor. The original paper that was put out was questionable to a lot of people. And because this is essentially the holy grail of science, there's been a lot of people that don't believe that this is a real thing. And one of the things that made it so questionable is that it seemed so easy to produce by comparison. And if it turns out that this is true, this is something that might have been stumbled upon by alchemy, you know, 700 years ago, and just, we didn't, for whatever reason. But it's been an incredibly interesting story to follow as more tests are being done. I'm still waiting for a final confirmation that yes, this is real, or no, this has been a hoax the whole time, because really everyone's waiting with bated breath. But if it turns out that this is a real room temperature superconductor, this is another thing just like AI that could change the face of the world of technology. You know, superconductors right now are used for things like MRIs, but they're so prohibitively expensive because they have to be like chilled to almost absolute zero to work. It's insane. So yeah, when it comes to LK99, I do have a lot of optimistic hope. If it turns out to be a room temperature superconductor, it's not the easiest thing in the world to produce. It seems like it's been kind of hit and miss for the people that have been trying to recreate it. But it's been promising enough that I wanted to report on it this week because hopefully we'll have a decision over the course of the next week and we'll know for sure one way or another next week. But I'll end today's video on that note. And if this was your first time stopping by, I really do appreciate you making it to the end of the video. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I look forward to seeing you next week. I'm really curious to see the comments too this week. We covered a lot of topics, everything from music to medicine to superconductors. We're kind of all over the place. And I'm curious on your thoughts as to where you think the world is going from here, because sometimes it feels like we're just guessing at this point. But as the world continues to change around us at this absolutely insane pace, I will do my best to keep up with it and keep you informed here. And again, I appreciate you spending time with me here today, and I'll see you next week for another AI news, drama, and updates. Thank you for watching.